Shabbat Shalom. Thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to welcome everybody that is watching online and watching from around the world. I'd like to also welcome those of you that are here, and I'd like to encourage you to come join us here. Uh, no matter where you live, we have people from all over East Tennessee, uh, northern Georgia even, western North Carolina that come and join us here. Some of you are not able to be here today uh, that are watching from North Carolina and other places. Uh, we'd like to wish you well wishes and say that we're praying for you. And uh, even those of you watching in Florida, some of our members are down there watching right now. Uh, we have online members who watch from Florida. Uh, we have people literally all over this nation and all over the world watching. So thank you for joining us each and every week. Today is January the 19th, 2019. So it's one nineteen nineteen on the Gregorian calendar. On the Hebrew calendar, it is the 13th day of the Hebrew day Shavat. On the Hebrew calendar, 5779. The next month on the Hebrew calendar is the month of Adar. And this year we have two Adars, Adar 1, Adar 2. I encourage you to go to olivetreemessianic.org, olivetreemessianic.org. That's our website. Check us out. Uh, each week, go to our website. Each day, go to our website because we have a, the daily Bible verse from the Tree of Life version. We also have a daily update of the Israeli news at the bottom. Each week, I put up a new Torah portion outline, and also you have the Torah portion reading right there on our website on the home page you have a way for you to donate directly from our website as well so please go check us out olivetreemessianic.org you also see at the top left hand corner all of our icons our social media icons for facebook youtube so on and so on go check us out today's tour portion is number 16 bashalak which means in English, when he sent away, or some translations say when he let go. When he let go. And again, it's reading number 16. You see the readings there on the screen. I'm not going to reread those for you. Again, you can find that on our website as well. So I want to get right into the message today. Why? Because we've got a deep one. If uh, those of you who like a deep one, and you like digging deep into the Word and finding out details, you're going to love this one. Uh, those of you who, who get a little sleepy on the details, you will get sleepy during this message today. It is a deep message. Amen? Uh, now, I will say this. It is a message to where there is some uh, uh, disagreement in the Messianic movement. But we can ad disagree on some things without arguing about things, right? We can have, and that's what we're having here today with me teaching this message, we can have a discussion without arguing. That's one thing that I dislike. Now, I, I discuss things with people all the time. I discuss things with David in the back. We have some good discussions. and uh, uh, But I, I do not like arguing. I don't think that it's right. I don't think that it's biblical to argue because arguing only causes division. This message today, again, is one that there's some disagreements on. The title of today's message is The Red Sea and First Fruits. The Red Sea and First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits is what I'm referring to. And it is the timing of the Feast of First Fruits that is the, uh, the disagreement. Okay? Now, it's okay for me to teach you different viewpoints on this. Last year, I taught a different viewpoint on this. This year, I'm, I'm going back to the one that I've always really believed in. But last year, I, I taught you a different way of looking at this. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that, uh, uh, that, that I'm up here teaching anything wrong. There's some things in Scripture that we can have different viewpoints, different interpretations. That's a good word to use. Different interpretations, right? Like everybody, I always use this excuse or this example because it's the best one. The rapture. That's a big one where you have different interpretations. When's it going to happen? Pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. Well, this is another one of those subjects. 
In tour portion, Bashalak. Bashalak. We have the crossing of the Red Sea. Chloe, go sit over here. In tour portion, Bashalak, we have the crossing of the Red Sea. This occurred during what would later become the season of first fruits. Now, again, it's debatable exactly that day when they crossed. Was it the 16th, the 17th, the 18th? That really doesn't matter when they crossed the Red Sea. What matters is, is that it's the season of first fruits. It was the time of the counting of the first fruits, the counting of the Omer, okay? Now, I'm going to get off of the Red Sea, but I wanted to just lay that foundation there, okay? The crossing of the Red Sea. Now, first fruits, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, symbolizes uh, the resurrection because the resurrection occurred on first fruits, as we will see a little bit later in the message today. But the crossing of the Red Sea is also a picture of the resurrection. Think about that. They crossed over from death in Egypt, death and slavery in Egypt. They crossed over to life, right? Amen? Everybody with me? This season of first fruits started on what is called the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits. When a sheaf or an omer is what it's called, a, a bundle, a sheaf of, of grain of green barley. It was the first grain to ripen in the year. Imagine, you know, some of you have, uh, uh, some of you have things that come up first. We have those uh, spring lilies that come up. They're the first things in late February and early March here in East Tennessee that you see. And you have certain trees like the willow tree. They're the first to bloom. Well, the green barley, it was the first to come up. It was still green. It wasn't ripe yet. But they were commanded to take a sheaf, to bundle it up, and to cut it, and to offer it up to God as a thanksgiving offering. And they waved it before the Lord. And that happened on the Feast of First Fruits. It was to be waved before the Lord in a ceremony which started the 49-day count to the Feast of Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost. And I'll talk more about some of these details this coming spring, okay, when we get into the celebration of these feasts. But why is it important today? Because we're there at that point in the book of Exodus. But here's where you can get into different interpretations. The exact day of the Feast of First Fruits has been debated for centuries. Not just in the Messianic movement, but for centuries. The exact day of the Feast of First Fruits has been debated. Why? Because in Scripture it doesn't just plainly state it. Why sometimes does God do that, do you think? Because I think He likes these discussions, not arguments, but He likes for you to dig. He likes for you to explore His Word and try to find these answers and dig in the original language. He knew that we would be here today with hundreds of thousands of different languages, and He wanted you to go back to His original language and dig and learn this stuff, right? Let's turn to... Leviticus chapter 23, and let's read, because here's where you have the feast. Every, every one of you, maybe some of you don't know this, maybe you're watching this for the first time. Every one of you, when somebody asked you about the feast of the Lord, and they asked you where they're at, Leviticus 23. That chapter, if you write or highlight in your Bible, that one should be wrote in, underlined, highlighted. It should be wrinkled. Your Bible should just fall right open to it. You should know where Leviticus 23 is. We're going to pick up our reading in verse 9. We're going to read 9, 10, and 11, and then we're going to skip down and read verses 15 and 16. I'm going to read first from the New American Standard. Our main Bible translation here that we have back there in our bookshelf for everyone to use is the Tree of Life. That's our main one. The uh, New American Standard is, is like the brother, the older brother of the Tree of Life. 
Uh, they both come from the same parent translation, which is the American Standard Version. Both of them are very literal, but the New American Standard is extremely literal. It's known as the closest thing to the original Hebrew that you can get. So that's why I chose to read this today, but I'm going to read also from the complete Jewish Bible as well. So, let's pick up our reading in verse 9. Then the Lord, Adonai, spoke to Moses, Moshe, saying, verse 10, Speak to the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel, and say to them, When you enter the land which I'm giving you. See, they haven't entered the land yet. They're still in the wilderness. When you enter the land which I'm giving to you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Remember that sheaf of green barley I told you about? Now this is kind of like tithing. This is almost like a feast of tithing, you could say. This teaches you how to tithe. Verse 11. He shall wave the sheep before the Lord for you to be accepted. And here comes the different interpretation. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Stop there. Stop there before we go to verse 15. What Sabbath is it talking about? There's 52 weekly Sabbaths in a year. Beyond that, there's uh, Sabbath days in the feast as well. So what Sabbath do you think it's talking about? Well, if you go in chronological order, it talked about the weekly Sabbath at the very first of chapter 23. But then, since then, it's moved on, and now it's talked about Passover and unleavened bread. It's talked about that Sabbath. I use the word that Sabbath because some translations there, uh, I believe it was the Art Scroll. Art Scroll, which is a, uh, a Jewish translation directly from the Hebrew. In the Art Scroll translation, it says, then on that Sabbath, referring to the very last one it just talked about, which was unleavened bread. So on that Sabbath you are to bring the sheaf and shall wave it, bring it to the priest. Skip down to verse 15. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. Again, what Sabbath? But I like that translation that says that Sabbath, referring back to the last one it talked about in chronological order in this chapter, which is unleavened bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Sabbath day. From the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. Okay, now that's confusing. And I'll explain. Seven complete Sabbaths. What do you mean a complete Sabbath? I'll explain momentarily. Verse 16. Let's read it. You shall count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. Okay. If you back up a little bit in verse 15, there's a different way of translating that that will help us. Uh, the tree of life, they translate it correctly. The tree of life does. But the tree of life gives you the exact Hebrew word there. Do they not, for those of you who have a tree of life in front of you, do they not say Shabbatot? Shabbatot? That's right, but that's literally the Hebrew word. That doesn't help those of us in English, right, to figure out exactly what that means. But where the confusion really lies here, where you can get a different translation, is looking at the words complete Sabbath. Seven complete Sabbaths. The Sabbath is just one day. Let me read to you the complete Jewish Bible. I think they word this correctly in the complete Jewish Bible, okay? Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 15. says, From the day after the day of rest, again, referring to the day of rest of unleavened bread, that Sabbath day, that is from the day you bring the sheaf for the waving, you are to count seven full weeks. Weeks. Now, I think this is a 
correct translation here because if you literally translate it, yes, it translates into Sabbath, but you've got to look at the whole sentence structure and how it is worded, and you've got to, to think a complete Sabbath. Well, a complete week makes more sense. Seven complete Sabbaths or seven complete weeks. Uh, a Sabbath finishes the week, right? Now, if you think, oh, Robert, the complete Jewish Bible is wrong here, well, I'm getting ahead of myself on the notes, but I'm going to go ahead and say this anyways. How many of you are familiar with the uh, uh, Septuagint? Okay, the Septuagint is literally the first ever translation. Not the first ever Bible. The first ever Bible was Hebrew. A translation is a translation of the original, right? The Septuagint is Greek. It was translated before Yeshua was born. It was translated by rabbis, Jewish rabbis. They knew their Hebrew. They knew their observance. They knew the law. They knew how they did everything. They were still a temple at that time and so forth. They agree with the complete Jewish Bible here that that is weeks. Seven complete weeks you are to count. Uh, let me read verse 16 for you. Leviticus 23, 16 in the uh, complete Jewish Bible. Until the day after the seventh week, you are to count 50 days. And then you are to present a new grain offering to Adonai. Okay, jump over to Deuteronomy. It's good to let the Word explain the Word, right? It's good to let the Word interpret the Word, correct? So let's see what Deuteronomy 16 says. In Deuteronomy 16, you have the three big feasts. You have the, the three pilgrim feast days of the Lord. You have Passover. You have Shavuot or Pentecost. And then you have the Feast of Booths or Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, in Deuteronomy 16. But look at verse 9. We're just going to look at one verse here. Verse 9. Because verse 9 explains the Sabbaths and explains the counting. Look at how it words it. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard again. I've went back to that. They get it right right here. They get it right this time. It says in verse 9, You shall count seven weeks for yourself. You shall begin to count seven weeks from the time you bring from the time you begin to put the sickle of the standing grain. From the time you put the sickle to the standing grain. In other words, from the time you cut that sheaf and you go to wave it before the Lord. You think, Robert, why are you explaining all these details? Well, again, this is something that has been debated for more than 2,000 years. So why should we not enter into the debate and, and try to figure out what the Lord's saying here, Right? And this helps us explain the crucifixion and the resurrection, when that occurred, and so on. That's what I'm getting to in this message, so just hang on. Seven complete weeks. So Deuteronomy confirms what the complete Jewish Bible said back in Leviticus 23, right? That is, you're to count seven weeks. In English, what's the Feast of Shavuot called in English? The Feast of what? Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. Uh, it's not the Feast of Sabbaths. It's the Feast of Weeks. And in, in the Greek, it's Pentecost. Pentecost is referring to the days, 50 days. Okay, back on my notes. The Sadducees, who were corrupt, by the way. You did know that the Sadducees, you know the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? I'm going to talk about them a lot through the rest of this message. The Sadducees were corrupt. Why were they corrupt? They were in with King Herod. They were in with Rome. They were the elite. They wasn't the populace, the people. They were the elite. They were in with the government officials and so on and so on. Uh, the Sadducees believed, along with the Samaritans, the Samaritans were a mixed group of people, so therefore they had mixed religions. In other words, their beliefs were a little mixed up too. 
And the Sadducees was a little mixed up because of their being involved with the government. Or not the government, but the elite corrupts. Well, yeah, you could say the government with, with Rome and Herod. But both the Sadducees and the Samaritans understood the phrase, the day after the Sabbath, as being the first day of the week. And what we would call Sunday. Therefore, never having a fixed day on the Hebrew calendar, on the Jewish calendar. You tracking with me? But the Pharisees, here's where the controversy and, and the disagreement came in. The Pharisees, who were the, uh, the, the part of the people, the populace, they were very popular amongst everyone, the common people. They were the ones that had the synagogues. Uh, the Sadducees, they just stayed in Jerusalem around the temple, but the Pharisees had synagogues all throughout Israel. They were the common people. The Pharisees said that the phrase, the day after the Sabbath, refers to the special Sabbath of unleavened bread. In other words, the, the Sabbath that happened on Nisan 15, the day after, was first fruits. That's what the Pharisees believed. Therefore, first fruits would always, have, would always fall on the 16th day of Nisan but not a fixed day of the week. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? Kind of like your birthday. Does your birthday always fall on a Monday? No, it kind of floats. Okay, the Pharisees say that first fruits is always on the 16th day of Nisan. It could be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so on. But the Sadducees say, no, that Sabbath is talking about the seventh day Saturday Sabbath, so therefore first fruits is always going to be on a Sunday. But again, I've already proven a little bit through Leviticus 23 that that's wrong. And through Deuteronomy 16 that, that the Sadducees is wrong and the Pharisees is right. Again, let's let Scripture interpret Scripture. Here's the, here's the last place I'm going to have you turn for today. And then I'm going to read from my notes the rest of the time. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. We're going to read verses 10 through 12. This is the perfect example right here. Here you have Joshua and the children of Israel just coming, just crossing over into the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land that would later become known as the land of Israel. How do they keep the Passover? How do they keep the first fruits? You would think if anybody would know, they would know, right? Are you following with me? Amen? Verse 10. I'm going to read from the New American Standard again. Again, this is as literal as you could get it from this translation. It says, While the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel, camped near Gilgal, or camped at Gilgal, they observed the Pesach, or the Passover. They kept the Passover. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, in other words, the evening of the 14th day of, of the month of Nisan, on the desert plains of Jericho. Verse 11. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened breads, and parched grain. Okay, stop there for a second before we read verse 12. What does that mean, Robert? What does that mean they ate of the parched grain and they ate of the produce of the land? They were not allowed to do that until they offered up the first fruits. They were not allowed to do that until they celebrated first fruits and gave of the first fruits. So in other words, on the day after Passover, they celebrated first fruits. You tracking with me? They didn't, they didn't wait a few days later and they did it after the weekly Sabbath. They did it the, after Passover. Let's read verse 12. Here's how, here's how God thought about it, okay? God didn't get mad at them. In verse 12, it says, The manna ceased on that day, because that's what it was supposed to do. That means they did it right. You did good, children of Israel. Now you're in the land. You offered up the, the first fruits, the tithe of the land. Now I'm going to stop giving you the manna, because you've got the land to feed on. So the manna ceased on that day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land. 
so that the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel, no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. Now, some people get hung up on the word Passover there, the day after Passover. Even though the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th of Nisan, was literally called unleavened bread, it was also referred to as matzah. I mean, I'm sorry, it was also referred to as Passover. Let me rephrase that since I messed it up. The first day of unleavened bread was literally called the day of matzah, unleavened bread, but it was also called Passover. I can prove my point to you. I don't have this on the screen here, so bear with me, but Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 1. You can turn there if you want, but I'm already there. I can read it to you. It says, Now on the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover. So you see, how many of you refer to the whole week of unleavened bread as Passover? Right? I mean, it's just, we just call it Passover. So, what they're talking about here in Joshua 5 is that on the 14th day, think, follow, follow with me here in your mind, on the 14th day, they ate of the Passover. At evening, at sunset, and that goes over into the 15th, right? Your Passover seders, your Passover meals, it, it goes into the 15th. And then the day after, on the 16th, they celebrated the Feast of First Fruits. Do you see that? So therefore, that confirms what we read in Deuteronomy. That confirms what we read in Leviticus. Now see, I'm just letting Scripture prove Scripture here. Now, if you still don't believe me, maybe some of you say, Now, Robert, no, I, I agree with the Sadducees on this. Well, I've got a lot more proof for you. I've loaded this message with proof, with details. Let's continue on. The 3rd century B.C., before the Common Era or before Christ, translation of the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek called the Septuagint, I've already spoke about this, provides another example of how this passage was understood by the majority of Jews. The Septuagint agrees with the complete Jewish Bible's reading of Leviticus 23, calling it count seven weeks. And then after seven weeks, you are to have Shavuot. But it started, the count started the day after Passover. The apostles, maybe some of you think, well, I don't like the Septuagint. Well, listen to this. The apostles showed their approval of the Septuagint by quoting from it frequently in the New Testament. Did you know that? Many, you know, the New Testament, the majority of it was written in Greek, right? Some, I believe, was written in Hebrew, such as maybe Matthew, such as uh, uh, maybe some of James's letters. All of Paul's letters was written in Greek, though, because Paul, was, uh, Paul knew Greek, number one, and he was the apostle to the Gentiles, number two. Now, somebody like Matthew, his book was addressed to the Jewish people, so his would have been more, uh, his probably would have been written in Hebrew, Right? But the apostles quite frequently quoted directly from the Greek, Septuagint. A lot of their sayings in the New Testament is identical, word for word, from the Greek Septuagint. So they put their stamp of approval on it. They said, we agree with this translation. It's a good one, right? And again, the Septuagint agrees with the complete Jewish Bible way of reading Leviticus 23. Another example for you, another evidence of what I'm saying here is, is right on the Feast of First Fruits. In the first century A.D., so now we're in after the death of Yeshua, uh, during the, uh, after the time of the New Testament. In the first century A.D. temple practice, the Pharisees was in charge of the order of service in the temple. Now the Sadducees were the ones, again, who was in with the government, in with Rome, in with Herod. But the Sadducees knew, at least they were smart in this one way, they knew that the Pharisees were the more popular group. And they knew that the people wanted things done the way the Pharisees did. So the Pharisees was in charge of the order of service in the temple. 
And again, one reason for this is due to their popularity with the people. Therefore, the Pharisees' belief on the, first, on the Feast of first fruits would have been followed in the temple service. So when the temple celebrated first fruits, how do you think they did it? When do you think they did it? I'm asking you a question. Answer me. Talk to me. This is a trivia question for you. See if you've been listening. If the Pharisees was in charge of the temple service and they had a celebration of first fruits in the temple, what day do you think they would have did it on? The 16th of Nisan. You follow me? Everybody needs to get a DVD of this when we're over. So you can re-listen to this because it's, it's some deep thinking. But again, it's going to help answer some questions for you. Another example, Flavius Josephus. How many of you have heard of him? I've got his book right here. He gave me a copy of this. No, he didn't. But uh, this, is, this is his book. Very good book. This is my personal one. This is not, I don't think this is in the library. Uh, Flavius Josephus. He was a first century temple priest. He was in the priesthood in the first century. He wrote, this is his exact words, he wrote on the second day of unleavened bread, that would be the 16th, which is the 16th day of the month, they first partook of the fruits of the earth. Again, that's when they celebrated first fruits. Okay, here's another example for you. Another witness. Another first century Jewish eyewitness, Philio, reported there is also a festival during unleavened bread which secedes the first day, which comes after the first day. And this is called or named the sheaf. So he again confirms that the 16th day of Nisan is the day of first fruits. And again, maybe some of you is asking the question, why didn't God just come right out and say it? I think he wants us to dig. He likes that we dig and try to find these answers. Both eyewitnesses, or both witnesses, agree that first fruits was kept in accordance with the reckoning or the understanding of the Pharisees. More often than not, now get this, we talked about the apostles' approval of the, uh, the Septuagint. Well, now I want to talk to you about Yeshua and the Pharisees a little bit. More often than not, Yeshua agreed with the Pharisees over the Sadducees concerning scriptural disagreements. Now, did Yeshua disagree with the Pharisees a lot on some of these traditions that they tried to put above the Bible? Yes. But when it comes to Scripture, Yeshua agreed more with the Pharisees than the Sadducees. Let me give you an example. The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They did not believe in the books of the prophets. What side do you think Yeshua took on that? He agreed with the prophets, right? So he agreed with the Pharisees. Okay, the Sadducees believed that once you died, that was it. There was nothing else for you. You're done. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. What side do you think Yeshua took on that? With the Pharisees. So Yeshua, scripturally speaking, was from the Pharisees. But, again, that doesn't mean that he took on all their traditions. He argued with them quite a bit on that. Not argued, but disagreed with them quite a bit on that. Even more than that, remember what Yeshua told them in the Gospels? He said, follow the Pharisees. Follow their, their leadership. Do as they say. Don't necessarily do as they do, he said, because they're people like everybody else. But he said, do as they say. So Yeshua put his stamp of approval on the Pharisees' authority. Alfred Edersheim, a noted 19th century historian. 19th century would have been the 1800s. He is a Messianic Jew. How many of you have heard of him? Edersheim. He gave me his book as well. I've got it right here. Uh, he recorded in this book that the Sadducees' compliance to the Pharisees, 
He, he, he recorded their compliance to the... Uh, he com- I'm sorry, let me say that again. He recorded that the Sadducees complied to the Pharisees when it come to the Feast of First Fruits. In other words, he recorded that during the temple service, that yes, the Pharisees was the ones who was in charge, and therefore that they had the celebration of the Feast of First Fruits on the 16th day of Nisan. Aren't you enjoying this, all this evidence that I'm bringing forth? This is not my opinion, folks, on this. This is proving through history and through Scripture when the day of first fruits is, when we should celebrate the resurrection. History shows the majority in the first century celebrated first fruits in accordance to the Pharisees. Modern day Judaism believes the same as the Pharisees. So if you get the Jewish calendars, Nisan 16th, the day after unleavened bread, is the the Feast of First Fruits. So modern-day Judaism believes the same as the Pharisees concerning first fruits, thus observing this feast on the 16th day of Nisan. Another reason that some accept modern-day Jewish interpretation on first fruits is because they believe God gave His oracles to the Jewish people and therefore the Preservation, preserving of the calendar and the holy days is under their authority. And I can see that. God did give that to them. It was up to them to let the light shine, right? It was up to them to preserve the feast. It was up to them to preserve the calendar. Because what happened around the year 325 A.D.? Constantine. And what happened with Christianity? Did Christianity preserve the feast? Did Christianity preserve the calendar? No. But the Jewish people did. The Jewish people preserved it for us and they kept it for us. So therefore, a lot of people then would follow them because they kept it all these years, right? God gave them the oracles and gave them the command to keep this stuff. And they did a good job of it. So now I want to get into... The timing of the crucifixion and the resurrection. Because this ties right into when the Feast of First Fruits is. A lot of people get caught up on a certain phrase three days and three nights. You ever heard of that? Three days, three nights. To me, that's not where you start figuring out the timing of the crucifixion and resurrection. To me, you've got to figure out when. The Feast of First Fruits was, and I'll explain. So, now concerning the timing of the crucifixion and the resurrection, we must remember how Yeshua's ministry, now get this, Yeshua's ministry follows the exact timing of the feast. Can we all agree on that, right? His ministry, everything he did, was the exact timing of the feast. Everything in Scripture, Yeshua right down to the very last detail, fulfilled it. Right? The Gospels say that he was crucified on Nisan the 14th at the time of the Passover lamb sacrifice. We all agree upon that, right? So he was crucified. As soon as the priest said when he uh, sacrificed that lamb and the priest said, it is finished, Yeshua said on the cross, it is finished. The exact time. So he was crucified on the 14th. And we all can agree that he was buried at the start of the 15th. At the start of unleavened bread. Yeshua who is unleavened. Without sin. And that bread represents his body. He was put into the grave at the exact start of the 15th of Nisan. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15... You can read this on your own time. If you're writing notes, write this verse down. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, verse 20, and also 23, that Yeshua is our first fruits. Paul says Yeshua is our first fruits. When is the day of first fruits? The 16th. We've already established that today, right? So you tracking with me? Crucifixion, 14th. 
burial 15th, resurrection 16th. You see that? You tracking with me? Amen? But again, some of you are thinking, well, what about that verse in Matthew 12, verse 40, where Yeshua said, The Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth, the belly of the earth, three days and three nights. But again, if you look at it, if you take that one verse and you pull that out without looking at the entirety of Scripture, without looking at uh, others' interpretation of it in Jewish history, it, it messes you up. I used to get confused about this. But again, to me, I figured out when first fruits was, and I figured out that he fulfilled everything else exactly at the right time. I think he rose exactly on the 16th day on the Feast of First Fruits, and I know he was crucified on the 14th. So then let me explain to you the three days and three nights. Again, from our understanding, from late on the 14th day to early on the 16th is not a full three days or 72 hours. From our understanding. But the biblical way of thinking... You, you can't think about this in a Western mentality, in a Western world. The biblical way of thinking, the biblical way of counting days, was that any portion or any part of the day was considered a full or complete day. Remember I touched on this last week, right? For those of you that were here. Remember how I explained to you that last week, how many of you have ever said, I used this example last week, how many of you have ever said, I worked all day long? Did you literally work 24 hours? No. So you just counted part of a day as a full day. That's the Jewish way of counting days as well. And I've got scripture that I could prove this to you. Okay? So if you're taking notes, I'm getting ready to give you a lot of verses. Many great things throughout the Bible happened key word here, on, on the third day. Not after the third day, but on the third day. Write these verses down. Genesis 22, 4. Something great occurred on the third day. Genesis 22, 4. Exodus 19, 11. Again, read these at home on your own time because we're going to move right on. Numbers 19, 12. And Esther 5, 1. Esther, that's the one I can remember uh, most of anything. Esther asked them to pray for three days. And then guess what they did? She said, pray and fast. Pray and fast for three days. And then on the third day, they broke fast. Not after three days but on the third day. All the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the Gospels have a verse which says the resurrection would be either, and I'm quoting, the third day or in three days. Either the third day or in three days. None of them say after three days, except for that one verse that says three days and three nights. So, do you see this, what I'm trying to say here? Now think about this. This is just a common sense way of looking at it, okay? If the resurrection was after three days and three nights, well then the resurrection would have occurred on the fourth day day. Think about that. If, if you have to put 72 literal hours in there, three full days, well then Yeshua rose on the fourth day. And He didn't rise on the fourth day. Do, do you get that? That's just common sense way of looking at it, right? Hosea chapter 6 verse 1. Read that when you get home. It speaks of the resurrection when it says, On the third day, He will 
raise us up. And of course, he's referring to Yeshua. But when Yeshua rose, we rose with him, right? Because one of these days we're going to rise because of what he did. So Hosea says on the third day, not after. Acts chapter 10, verse 40 says, God raised him, referring to Yeshua, up on the third day. Not after, but on the third day. Therefore, Matthew 12, 40, where it says he's going to be in the grave for three days and three nights, it cannot mean a full three days or a full 72 hours. Do you see that? Again, think about that. Nisan 14th, he, he, he was crucified on Nisan 14th, that's one. He was in the grave on Nisan 15th, that's two days. And he rose on Nisan 16th, that's three. There you go, you've got your three days. And any part of that day counts as a full day, so again, you've got the full three days and three nights there. Does that make sense to you? We'll pray about it some more if it doesn't and continue to study it out. Because uh, let me say this as well. As Sabbath keepers, this is in my conclusion. As Sabbath keepers, well, let me back up for just a second. Let me back up before I go on. Okay, if we established that uh, Nisan 16th was the uh, first fruits, right? We established that, Nisan 16th? Okay. If he was in the grave a full three days and a full three nights, he was crucified on the 14th, then he would have rose after first fruits was over. First fruits would have been completely over. The sheaf offering would have been completely done. Then he missed that exact timing to rise from the grave on the Feast of First Fruits if you put, have to put in there a full three days and three nights. Right? You miss that. Plus, I believe, if you, if you confirm that he was crucified on that Friday, we know he rose on the first day. And we know that was the 16th of Nisan now, as we've established. And you back that up to the 14th, you've got a Friday. And it talks about the preparation day. Uh, there was no other day referred to as preparation day other than the preparing for the weekly Sabbath. It never talked about, uh, it never literally called preparation day before uh, Passover or before Rosh Hashanah or before this. It always talked about preparation day for the weekly Sabbath. So, he was crucified on a Friday and he rose early on the first day of the week on a Sunday morning before sunrise on the 16th day of Nisan. That strengthens our case as Sabbath keepers. We all love the Sabbath, right? We believe in keeping the Sabbath. That that I just laid out strengthens your case for keeping the Sabbath. Let me tell you this. As Sabbath keepers, the timing of Yeshua's crucifixion and resurrection only strengthens our case to keep the Sabbath. Just as God finished His work on a Friday or the sixth day, Yeshua finished His work on the cross. Have you ever thought of it like this? God finished His work Friday evening. Yeshua finished His Friday evening on the cross. Just as God rested from His work on Shabbat on the seventh day, Yeshua rested on Shabbat on the seventh day. Just as Sunday, first day of the week, begins a new work week for us, Yeshua rose from the grave to begin a new work in us. So this scenario that I gave you today strengthens our case for the Sabbath, right? How many of you, is, somebody has talked to you about uh, the Sabbath, what day it is, and they tell you, how do you know for sure that it's Saturday? How do you know for sure that it's not changed over the years? How do you know for sure that, uh, uh, that, that it was not what we consider a Wednesday or Thursday or whatever day? And you know what I tell them? 
I say, what day do you believe Yeshua was crucified? And they say, oh, he was crucified on a Friday. I say, okay, what did they have to do? They had to hurry and take him off the cross because of what? The Sabbath. Sabbath was Saturday. So see, that scenario strengthens our case to keep Saturday Sabbath. Right? Again, you can't go against all these witnesses that we've talked about here today. If you nail down the timing of the Feast of First Fruits being the 16th, and you say he had to rise on the 16th, but he was crucified on the 14th, then you cannot fit a full three days and three nights in there. It's impossible. It's impossible. But the most important thing, as I close, the most important thing about this teaching is our agreement that Yeshua is the Passover Lamb. Right? We can all agree upon that as Messianic believers. Can I get an amen? amen? And that He is our unleavened bread. Yeshua is our unleavened bread. And that Yeshua is our first fruits. You know, you can be saved and born again without knowing any of these details I taught about today. But as believers, we should starve for these answers. We should strive. We should want them. Right? We should want to try to dig. And get this, what I said today perfectly bridges together Judaism, which teaches the 16th day of Nisan and first fruits, and it bridges together Christianity. And it says that we're not going totally against you two and coming up with our own thing. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're not coming up with something totally new here. Instead, this bridges the two together. Isn't that great? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's not the reason for me doing this. No, I gave you plenty of scriptural evidence and historical evidence. But it's, it's great that it bridges them together. That way, whether you come in these doors from a Jewish background, we celebrate the first fruits the same time you do. If you come in this door from a Christian background, we agree and can prove that the crucifixion happened and the resurrection happened the same time that you believe it. Amen? But here's the thing, though, before I close. As Messianics, we follow God's calendar, right? So if Passover happens uh, on a Tuesday, well then, that's when we celebrate His resurrection, on that Tuesday, right? I mean, His crucifixion, I'm sorry. We celebrate His crucifixion on that Tuesday because that's when Passover is, right? So then, on that Thursday would be the Feast of First Fruits. That's when we would celebrate His resurrection, on that Thursday, right? So we go by God's calendar. But it just so happened that that week He was crucified. God's calendar fell on a Friday, crucifixion, Saturday, resurrection. And guess what? This year... It does the same thing. <laughs> this year it does the exact same thing. Nisan 14th is on a Friday. First fruits uh, on 16th is on a Sunday. Falls the exact same way. Let us pray. Abba, I pray that all those who are listening to me today, Lord, that uh, they will dig into the Word and they will study and they will seriously take this message seriously take the points that I made and they will look at them Lord they won't just blow them off and, and immediately say that they're wrong Lord but they will look at them and they will pray about them they will look at the historic opinion about this Lord but Lord I pray that even if there is disagreement on this that there's no anger that there's no uh, arguing over this Lord I pray that our focus can be on Yeshua being the Messiah and Yeshua being our Lord and Yeshua being our Savior. Yeshua being our Passover and our first fruits. Because that's most important, the salvation of us all. And I pray that if anyone's listening to my voice, you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, just confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead on that feast of first fruits, and you will be saved. 
For God's Word says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Period. Call upon Him today. Repent of your sins. Accept Him as your Lord and as your Savior and your Messiah. And follow Him every day of your life. Lord, I pray for the unity of the body of Messiah. I pray that we can learn to love one another as you loved us, Lord, as you commanded us to love one another. And we thank you and praise you again for this message today. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If everyone would, please rise and let us bless one another with the ironic benediction. Again, for those of you that are here visiting, this is not the end of our service. We've got a couple more things that we do. Gather with your family and bless each other. We're all mishpokah here. We're all family, so gather with one another and pray the words on the screen here in front of you as we bless one another. Yavarekaka Adonai Vayishmareka Yaher Adonai Peinaveleka Vikuneka Yisa Adonai Peinaveleka Vayasim leka shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Sar Shalom, our Prince of Peace. Amen. And amen. May God bless you all. Thank you all for watching us today. Shavua Tov. Have a good week until we see each other again.